Our uh, scripture text for the sermon it is, comes from Paul's first letter to the Thessalonians, chapter 1, verses 2 through 10. Let us listen to the word of God. And I, I just, as, as I was reading it earlier, I was struck by just how full Paul is. You know, he, um, and there was a promise uh, in Second Corinthians that God's God's strength is made perfect in weakness, and this there's just fullness in this. And I noticed that one of the blessings that Paul sees in that in that church family in, in Thessalonica is that. They entered in to knowing Jesus with, it was trouble from the start for them. And, and, and Jesus met them in that trouble and drew them through it from the start. And, and, and as it's so rich, and, you know, people come to church, you know, some preachers say, come to church and you'll be successful. And Paul's kind of saying, you came to church and you were afflicted. <laughs> And so this is just beautiful, full of the grace of God. Let's listen to the word of God. We give thanks to God always for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers, loved by God, that he has chosen you, because our faith came to you not only in word but also in power, and in the Holy Spirit, and with full conviction. You know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction, with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere, so that we not, need not say anything, for they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you, and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God, to wait for his Son from heaven, whom you raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. This is the word of the Lord. Let us pray. Almighty God, Heavenly Father, bless, bless, bless our brother Jim as he shares word on Thanksgiving and how thankful your people can be for each other and seeing the heart of everything, seeing joy and pain and, 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 and really being part of all of it and just knowing. Help us to know. Help us to know the blessings. Help us to know where to find your grace, where you are in our lives, and help us to see that above all things, you are there, you are here. And so let Jim preach in that, in your gifts and fullness, and let us be in that fullness, even in our afflictions, when we hear the word of your love, when we hear the word of your faithfulness and your gifts to us, in Jesus Christ, who is you, born for us and suffering and dying for us to give us life. What a wonderful gift, Lord Jesus. Bless us with this, with Jim's message and our worship. Amen. Our sermon titled this morning is Giving Thanks in All Circumstances. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. At this Thanksgiving season, our hearts often turn to God to give thanks for many things. It's common to give thanks for our family, material blessings, and our health. I'm not sure but about you, but I confess that I often find it hard to do what it says in Ephesians 5.20. It it says, give thanks always for 
everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Or even in 1 Thessalonians 5, verses 16 to 18, it, it says to give thanks for what Paul commanded the Thessalonians. In verse 16, it says, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. I do all right. If I feel good, <laughs> it's easy to be thankful. And if I have had a good night's rest, or if the food is good, <laughs> it's easy to be thankful. But then on the other side, it's also all too easy to complain when the circumstances seem to be out of my, our control. And we are all commanded, but we are all commanded to give thanks even in all circumstances. So this morning, we're going to turn to the passage in 1 Thessalonians, and we'll start with chapter 1, verses 2 to 5, to consider together the teaching of the Holy Spirit to those in Thessalonica. We know that Paul often gave thanks for them as he told them in verses 2 through 5, chapter 1. He said, we give thanks to God always for you all, for all of you, constantly mentioning you in our prayers, remembering before our God and Father your work of faith, your labor of love, and your steadfastness of hope in our Lord Jesus Christ. For we know, brothers, beloved by God, that he has chosen you, because our gospel came not only to you, not only in word, but also in power and in the Holy Spirit and with full conviction. Paul recognized that they really believed the gospel and that he preached that he had preached to them he knew because he saw firsthand their works of faith and their labor of love and their steadfastness of hope in the lord jesus christ there's a direct relationship between what we believe deep in our hearts and how we live in acts 17 that records um, where Luke has written and records the events that took place in Thessalonica when Paul preached the gospel to them. And if you turn to chapter 17 of Acts, verse 1, it it's, tells the story and says, Now when they had passed through Amphilopolis Phil, and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue of the Jews. And Paul went in, and as was his custom, on three Sabbath days, he reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead, and saying, This Jesus, whom you I proclaim to you, is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded to join and join Paul and Silas, as did a great many of the devout Greeks, and not a few of the leading women. It is clear that, this, that the preaching of the gospel took place beginning at the Jewish synagogue in Thessalonica. For three Sabbaths, Paul explained to them that it was necessary for the Christ to suffer and rise from the dead. Then he argued that Jesus had fulfilled those scriptures and had risen from the dead. All of proof that he truly is the Son of God and the Messiah sent into the world. And some of the Jews believed, and a great many of the devout Greeks also believed what Paul had taught to them. As it is with when the Spirit of God is working and some are listening and believing, there's also those present 
who it doesn't fall on the heart of faith. And verse 5 says, but the Jews were jealous. And taking some wicked men of the rabble, they formed a mob and set the city in an uproar and attacked the house of Jason, seeking to bring, out, bring them out to the crowd. And when they could not find him, they dragged Jason and some of the, uh, the brothers before the city authorities, shouting, these men who have turned the world upside down have come here also. And Jason has received them. And they are acting against the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. And the people and, and the city authorities were disturbed when they heard these things. And when they had taken money as security from Jason and the rest, they let them go. The Jews... The ones who did not believe went out into the city and gathered together those they could stir up with a false accusation. And their intention was to do great harm to the Apostle Paul and his companions. They were going to give him over to the mob. But when they could not find him, they seized Jason and some other brothers. We assume when it says Brothers, it's referring to some others of the Thessalonians who have believed. As it, is, as, as it is often with jealousy, they used a bit of truth that Paul was teaching that Jesus is a king, that is, the Jewish Messiah, because the Christ must be born to the line of David and sit on the, th the throne and rule the nations. Then they added the false accusation that Paul and others were acting against the decrees of Caesar. They were falsely stirring up the crowd and authorities to believe that Paul was teaching rebellion against Rome. In 1 Thessalonians 1, verse 5, Paul continues speaking to the Thessalonians, saying, you know what kind of men we proved to be among you for your sake. And you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction with the joy of the Holy Spirit, so that you became an example to all the believers in Macedonia and Achaia. For not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth over everywhere, so that we need not say anything. For they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you, how we turn, how you turn to God from idols to serve the living and true God, and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he has who whom he raised from the dead, Jesus, who delivers us from the wrath to come. When it says, you received the word of God in much affliction, it's referring to the opposition to the gospel and the, the fact that some of them were dragged out before the city authorities. We don't know what kind of suffering they experienced. We can, we can guess possibly beatings or damage to their properties or public hatred and false accusations. They definitely paid some kind of a, a um, fee to be released from, from being arrested. In the midst of it all, they would have been required to give account concerning what Paul had taught them. So in effect, by testifying to their faith that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, who came and died for our sins, and the, the Word of God did sound forth from them to all those in Macedonia and to the authorities and, and the people of Achaia, the province of Achaia. They would have heard from the mouth of the Thessalonians that they had believed that Jesus is the Christ. 
who was crucified for their sins and that he rose from the dead. So let's turn again to Thessalonians to the passage um, in chapter 5 this time. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verses 12 to 18. Paul wrote to them saying, We ask you, brothers, to respect those who labor among you and who are over you in the Lord and admonish you and esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Be at peace among yourselves. As they obeyed Paul in these things, their work of faith and their labor of love would be made known to all. They turned to God and they received the apostles. They received the new leaders who came teaching them all that Jesus had taught regarding his kingdom. They respected them and they, because they loved them for their teaching and the leadership in teaching them the teachings of Jesus. They taught them how to live as God's children and in his kingdom. So in love for others, they were urged to live obedient to the teaching. Obedient to the teaching of the apostles and obedient to the teaching of Jesus. And Paul said in verse 14, we urge you, Brothers, admonish the idle, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with them all. These are cares, these are commands to care for one another. In love, they're encouraged to walk in obedience to the truth and not be idle. If some were discouraged, close to giving up, they encouraged them to stay strong in the faith in God. And they helped them to reach out and meet each other's needs. If some were poor or some were, were sick or in, in need. So in obedience to the teachings of Jesus, he taught them in verse 15, see that no one repays evil for evil, but always seek to do good to one another and to everyone. Then he said in verse 16, rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Since the Holy Spirit now dwelt in them, they could rejoice always. They did it just as Paul himself had done. He tells about his own experience in 2 Corinthians Chapter 6, verses 8 to 10. He says of himself, sorrowful, but always rejoicing. Beginning in verse 8 of 2 Corinthians chapter 6, through, through honor and dishonor, through slander and praise, we are treated as impostors, yet are true, as unknown, yet are well known, as dying, and behold, we live, as punished, yet not killed, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, yet possessing everything. It's not hard to find the different types of things that Paul's referring to in here, where he was beaten, 40 lashes minus one, Numerous times, near death, yet he, li but yet he lived, stoned, accused of being um, things that he was not, falsely accused by many of being a false apostle. Because of their new faith in Jesus and their hope in his return, the Thessalonians could always rejoice. And even while they suffered persecution at the hands of their fellow countrymen, they could still rejoice. And apparently they did. Having this newfound faith in Jesus, they went about with a joyful attitude, even though there were those hotly on their pursuit of them to punish them and accuse them and drag them before the authorities. Then through the Spirit of God and their hope in Jesus, they could also give thanks in all circumstances. 
the words of Paul meant a, a lot to them because they had been there and done it. Thanks that they, that they know God and they know God rewards those who suffer for his namesake. Thanks that no matter what happens, they have Jesus risen from the dead, ascended into heaven, interceding for them and preparing a place for them in his kingdom. It's much to give thanks for, thanks for in the message of the gospel. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 19, Paul continued with a prayer. He says, do not quench the spirit and do not despise prophecies, but test everything, hold fast what is good, abstain from every form of evil. Now, May the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. May your whole spirit and soul and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. And he will surely do it. So giving thanks when we don't feel there is much to give thanks for is not easy for us to do. So how do we live today and learn to give thanks for all the things according to the will of God in Christ Jesus for us? I think it begins by believing that Jesus reigns on high and is always there to work on our behalf. He works all things for good for those who love God and are called according to his purpose. Now consider with me Joseph in the Old Testament, Genesis chapter 37 and 28, and again in chapter 50, verse 20. There's a reminder of what happened to Joseph when his brothers sold him as a slave into Egypt. They considered him dead and gone. They dealt with this troublesome dreamer. But God, who knows all and rules over all, used their jealousy for his own purpose and his own good. He sent Joseph ahead, ahead of the very brothers who betrayed him. And he gave Joseph and Pharaoh's baker and cupbearer's dreams so that Joseph could give them the interpretation which God gave to him. He also gave Pharaoh dreams and Joseph the interpretation for his dreams. And then he raised up Joseph to rule over Egypt and to save many from famine. God rules over all, and even when it appears that the evil has gotten the upper hand, he is still in control. After the famine and the death of their father Jacob, Joseph's brothers feared greatly that Joseph might pay them back for the evil that they had done to him. But Joseph told his brothers, you meant evil, but God meant it for good. To bring about that many people should be kept alive as they are today. In Romans chapter 8, 28, Paul says this about it. Likewise, the spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought. But the Spirit himself intercedes of, with, for us with groanings too deep for words. And he searches hearts and knows what is the, and he who searches hearts and knows what is the mind of the Spirit, no, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good for those who are called according to his purpose. All things work together for good. And to have all things, you have to know that God is behind what evil is being done, and he is able to turn it for good for his people. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called, 
those he called, he also justified, and those he justified, he also glorified. So, whatever is currently happening in our lives, we are sure that God can use it to work for his own good. Ultimately, good things that will come to us as well. Therefore, we can, in faith, give thanks, knowing that God rules over all. Consider another example. Paul, in experiencing shipwreck and being thrown in prison. Paul could give thanks for the experience of a shipwreck, knowing that God who reigns over the weather could save him and those who on board ship with him in answer to his prayers. And he did on Malta. And all those who traveled with him heard his message and experienced the rescue of the Lord from the sea. He could endure prison, knowing that his example of faith and suffering would also be a witness to others who might suffer after him. And we now can give thanks because it was that very imprisonment that provided us with many of the Pauline letters, the word of God that speaks to our hearts today. Even those of us who are a little bit gray on top can say, Thank you, Lord, that you are still sovereign over our lives, even as we're aging. And the bodies are getting old and sometimes sick. But we know that the God who created us also reigns over the beginning and the end of our lives. And he sustains us through it all to the end. So what's the alternative? Just consider, what's the alternative? Is it to go on grumbling and complaining? And blaming somebody or accusing somebody for doing something we don't like. When things do not go our way. When people behave this way, they are in effect lacking in faith that God is reigning over all. And is in an ever-present help in, in times of need. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10 Verses 1 to 22, Paul says this to the Corinthians. I want you to know, brothers, that our fathers were all under the cloud, all passed through the sea, and all were baptized into Moses, into the cloud and in the sea, and all ate of the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, most of them, God was not pleased, for they were overthrown in the wilderness. Now these things took place as examples for us, that we might not desire evil as they did. So do not be idolaters, as some of them were. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. We must not indulge in sexual immorality, as some of them did. And 23,000 fell in a single day. We must not put Christ to the test as some of them did. And were, were destroyed by serpents. Now we know that the Jews in the wilderness put Yahweh to the test 10 times. But Paul says that they put Christ to the test. This seems to suggest that when the Lord told Moses to put a bronze serpent on a pole so that anyone bitten by the fiery serpents could look up at the bronze serpent and live, it was a symbol of Christ. Just as the the rock that issued water was a symbol of Christ. Christ who gives the living water. Christ who was raised up on a cross. So we are not to grumble as some of them did and were destroyed by the destroyer. 
Paul continues and says, now these things happen to them as an example and were written down for our instruction on whom the end of the ages has come. Therefore, let anyone who thinks that he stands take heed and lest, lest he fall. And then he says in verse 13, in regard to all these sins of faithlessness, no temptation has overtaken you that is not common to man. God is faithful, and he will not let you be tempted beyond your ability. But with the temptation will also provide the way of escape that you may be able to endure it. Giving thanks then in all circumstances is the first step of faith that helps us to begin to deal with the wickedness of our own hearts within. Once we turn to God and ask for help, once we pray and give thanks, we will invariably acknowledge that God rules over our lives and can use whatever is happening for his own good, even unseen good in our own lives. Thus, we will no longer be tempted to return evil for evil. We will no longer turn away from God in disbelief. We will no grumble and complain against him, but we will persevere in faith, holding to the promise that Jesus is with us and he'll never forsake us. This suggests that we can also give thanks regardless of who is the next president. <laughs> or we can give thanks whether we can safely gather all the family we would like for Thanksgiving celebrations. Or we can even give thanks for other personal difficulties that continually come our way. Let's also consider why our, our new identity in Christ should make a difference for giving thanks. We can do this because just like the Thessalonians, we have a new identity. I have a new heavenly family. Through faith in Christ, we are the children of God. And we all call on God as our father. We all have one Savior who died for our sins. And we have a heavenly hope who lives forever, interceding for us at the right hand of God. And we have a secure place in eternity that Jesus has gone to prepare for us so that we might be with him. We have a God who is ever-present and who cares. So as Peter says in 1 Peter, 1, uh, 1 Peter 5, 7, cast all your cares on him, for he cares for you. In this new identity, we're being renewed after the image of the creator. So through the power of the Holy Spirit, we can turn away from evil and with thankful hearts to God. Colossians 3 5 to 17, it says, put to death, therefore, what's earthly in you. Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, covetousness, and idolatry. On account of these things, the wrath of God is coming. In these two, you once walked when you were living in them. But now you must put them away. Anger. Wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk with your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in the knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not a Greek, not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but only Christ is all and in all. So the new self is our new identity. We have, as part of 
And we have this as part of the body of Christ. Our identity no longer comes from the ethnic origins, nor our education, nor our home country, nor our ancestral lines. That's not who we are. We truly are who God has made us to be, all one in Christ Jesus as part of the, the body of Christ because of our faith in him as our Savior. He has bought us as his own and made us one. Christ is our oneness. He reigns over all and is in all and who, all who trust him. He binds us together through the Spirit of God. So then, by the power of the Holy Spirit within us, as Paul says, put on then as God's holy chosen ones, holy, beloved compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other. As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all, Put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, in which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching, admonishing one another in all wisdom. Singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness, thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. Christ is in all who believe in him and who trust in him. He is binding us together, all together in one body. Christ is all and in all. So my application this morning for us, this Thanksgiving is not to let circumstances outside our control destroy our ability to say thank you to God. We know that anyone who is suffering isolation or depression or possibly thoughts of suicide, we need to reach out to them wherever possible. Our life is not hopeless. We have only to receive Jesus and truly believe that he is our hope and ever-present help in times of need. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do humbly bow before you. Lord Jesus, our Savior, we do worship you for the example of passion and compassion and kindness even to those who who were in hatred of you and the example of the apostles and the early believers in the church that teach us all what it's like to suffer for the for their faith teach us what it's like to call upon you with thanksgiving and joy in the midst of difficult situations Lord, our situations are not as difficult. We do not have people bashing down our door and dragging us down the street. Forgive us, Lord Jesus, when we complain and we grumble. We forget so easily. We forget so easily who you are, what you've done, and the meaning of the, of the things that we've heard for many, many years and how they ought to impact us. We forget your presence. Remind us, Lord, that you are with us for even to the end of the age and that you're there, ever-present help in the times of need, that we can boldly enter into your presence in the throne of God and pray anytime, any place, any, any time that we, can, we need to, to call upon you and find help and grace, amazing grace poured out to us in times of need. All of this because you died for us, Lord Jesus. We worship you this morning, and we lift up our thanksgiving and our praise in this season to you. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.